I am so excited because we actually have our first ever returning guest. And Lori Ann, you might have listened to her episode. It was episode 28. Um, it was called Finding Our True Selves by Healing Through the Nervous System. And Lori Ann is also an expert when it comes to prenatal psychology. And I've been so curious to pick her brain on this topic because I'm obviously a mom, but for any other person out there who's thinking about becoming a parent, I feel like this conversation is going to be so supportive and understanding that. And so, yeah, I'm just going to bring you in, Lori Ann. Thank you so much for coming back. We've had so much incredible feedback from your last episode. So just thank you so much for being a returning guest. Yeah, thank Welcome. you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. I want to just jump right in and maybe you can just start by explaining your background and your experience when it comes to this topic and maybe even why it's so um, close to your heart. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so my background on this, I studied pre and perinatal psychology. I also work at the Association of Pre and Perinatal Psychology and Health. Um, I I'm so passionate by this topic because I had a, a challenging start in the early life. Um, I got very sick the first few months of my life. So three, four months of my life, I was very, very sick. I had um, allergic colitis, so crying a lot. And obviously, you know, our parents and our caregivers, they respond to our temperament and how we behave as a baby, right? So my mm -hmm. parents were exhausted and that was impacting how they were responding to me. And the more I went into my healing process and my own journey, the more I discovered that um, those early experiences really affect us and really impact mm -hmm. us. And because I was so passionate by this and because I felt like this wasn't a conversation that was present on a mainstream level, I really wanted to get into this work and, and really support others who also had a challenging start early on in their yeah. lives. And I'm so glad that you did because I really don't feel like – people talk about it enough. Um, I know that like, obviously, when I was pregnant, there was a lot of discussion around that the baby feels your stress. And you know, the baby feels what you feel, but it still feels pretty abstract, because you're like, but it's not fully developed yet. Um, yeah, right. like, I feel like we have a misconception that just because babies aren't necessarily going to have recorded memories of their first few years, we're almost making the assumption that they're not conscious, but I would love for you to talk about that, how consciousness begins like at conception, right? They are conscious before they are born. And then of course, conscious once they come into the world and how that consciousness affects their first experiences of feeling safe in the world. Because something that I've recognized is that I behave in a lot of strange ways. <laughs> Obviously, like doing this healing work, you uncover so many of your patterns. And I just keep recognizing that these are ways that my body seeks to feel safe. And mm -hmm. it can feel so confusing because I think we all consciously understand that we are safe. But I think when our bodies as young people, even babies, our sense of safety is rocked, we have to create that sense of unsafety in our adult world. And then we try mm -hmm. to navigate. So I know that was a lot, but I would love for you to talk a little bit about that consciousness piece and how it starts and how that affects us from day one. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the there is research now that there is consciousness in the womb and there is consciousness at birth for the baby. Now, depending on our beliefs, I do believe that we are conscious before conception. I do believe that we come into the world as consciousness and mm -hmm. conscious conception is a whole field in itself that brings a lot of intentionality into bringing a child into the world. And, mm -hmm. you know, what we see in the womb now that what we know and what they can really witness with like, all sorts of scans is that babies response, babies senses are developed so they can smell, they can taste, they mm -hmm. can taste and they, they're they're going to respond in different ways depending on what if they like what they're tasting. It's mm -hmm. so interesting to see that they have preferences so early on. Mm -hmm. And there are people who have memories of things that they you know, that we can in ways that we can explain, let's just say. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of the other things. And I love that you named that there, there has been so much conversation in the field around the degree to which babies are conscious or the degree to which we remember those early life experiences. 
some people have very spiritual experiences and, and have memories or images of this early time in their lives, whether it's their birth, whether it's the few months after. But what we also know is that we have different types of memories. And mm. one of the types of memory that we have is implicit memory, meaning that there is no narrative, there is no story, mm. there is a feeling or a sense. And mm. we have that at that age. And that's something that is available to us as babies. So we can have memories. They're just different than, you know, our memories of going to the grocery store last week, right? So this is also a big piece. And I love that you named the sense of safety. Mm -hmm. um, feeling safe, feeling protected, feeling welcomed into the world as we walk into a room, as we connect with people, this all can relate very much to our early life experiences. Our ability to be celebrated can be so related to how we came into the world and how we felt we were received. Mm -hmm. I work with people mm -hmm. sometimes who whose parents did not want this pregnancy and they feel this sense of like, I'm not wanted into the world, even as an adult. And, and those mm. imprints, this is really what we call them in the field, those imprints can stay with us. And it's yeah. not a life sentence. This is definitely something that we can work through. However, it's important to bring awareness to that because how many of us don't even know that that's a thing, <laughs> right? Exactly. Mm. Yeah, mm. If it's like those feelings that we really can't explain. Yeah. And um, he, just even hearing you talk about the concept of in, an implicit memory, so something that our body remembers, but there's no narrative or story around. I find that when I experience sensations that feel, I guess, frightening or concerning for me, it almost feels like now I have to come up with a narrative to make that make sense. But yeah, what it feels like, actually, I heard someone say this recently, it actually is that my body's having a physical flashback without mm -hmm. without visual stimuli because I don't remember what I was seeing when I first experienced that. Does that track for you? Does that make any sense? Absolutely. That can definitely be the case. And, you know, sometimes by doing a little bit more exploration around these sensations, there might be something else that emerges. For some people, there's a belief that comes up. That's also something that can happen like, oh, I'm not safe in the world or there's this sensation that feels frightening. And as I explore it, there's this memory or this image that comes up. So sometimes there's more information that can be available with time as we deepen our capacity to explore. But also sometimes, you know, there is just this sense that this, you know, that's there or, or this um, sort of visceral memory that's here and, and we can reconnect with resources and with other sources of safety and supporting, we can support ourselves in moving through that response, right? Even mm -hmm. though we might not have a narrative for it. It's normal to want to make sense of those experiences. I think that's a very human thing. <laughs> we can all agree mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. And sometimes we don't need to. Mm -hmm. That's helpful to know because I think that on my journey, you know, I'm pretty aware of why I have the certain core wounds that I do just based off of what I do remember. Um, but now learning about your work, I'm like, well, what happened when I was in the womb? And there is this natural curiosity of wanting to know it so that I can heal it. But I feel like that's really going to be helpful for people to know that you don't always need to know exactly what happened in order to be able to live free from, from that suffering and that pain. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think sometimes, you know, there are things that we can't explain fully. And, mm -hmm. and we get to sometimes we get to become a little bit more at peace with that. Like, mm -hmm. I, I have some bits and pieces for myself around my early life. There are things that I've uncovered, right? I've mentioned I was sick for the first few months that impacted my attachment, definitely, right? And I know what environment I grew up in. I grew up with a caregiver that was chronically sick. So, mm -hmm. of course, there's a lot of survival. And I know that was there. Do I know all the ways in which that showed up? Not really, Right. But I get a pretty good sense of how that might have impacted my own nervous system, if that makes sense. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine this is going to bring up a lot of compassion for people already because, I mean, I can just see just sharing these stories, how, how imperfect of a world we come into when we're born, right? Totally. We're, per we're perfect as beings and then we're born into like usually a very brightly lit hospital with lots of noises and people who are stressed, including our main caregivers, um, mm -hmm. even exhausted maybe, or like you said, there could be a sense of unwelcomeness because who knows, maybe this is a financial stress that the mm -hmm. baby's being born into or... Who knows? Too many kids. I don't know. But um, I can just see that the environments that we're born into are not really perfectly engineered to ensure that we feel safe all of the mm -hmm. time. And so it makes so much sense that if we feel unsafe and we're not able to communicate that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we might cry or wail, but we feel so unsafe in the world for who knows how long until we can speak. And even beyond that, it would make sense then that so many of the coping mechanisms that we reach for in adulthood are just those grasps at and attempts at feeling safe. And I think that for myself, I've been able to forgive a lot more because I can see that it started so much earlier than my, my conscious choice. Yeah. 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 And I appreciate you naming that. I think it's a beautiful um, way to reframe. A lot of people with early trauma, and that was the case for me, we have a lot of coping strategies. Growing up in a survival environment, there's a lot of survival energy in our nervous system. My go-to was high anxiety or shutdown. That was kind of yeah. the range in which I was living. And I know a lot of people can relate to that. Mm -hmm. And with that comes a lot of coping strategies, right? Whether it's, you know, I work with people who sometimes um, there's food restrictions, that food and, and restricting food or counting calories is a big coping. Other people over-exercising, overworking, right? Those are all ways that we try to manage our states, right? Mm -hmm. And when we can shift the lens through which we are looking at people from a lens of like pathology and people are doing something wrong to the lens of, that person is working so hard to stay safe and find ways to find safety. I think that we unlock a level of compassion that many of us don't have access to. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all aware that these attempts to feel safe, although rooted in good intention, right? Mm -hmm. They're harmful sometimes, mm -hmm. of course, to ourselves, but to the people closest around us. And so given what you know about perinatal psychology and all of the information on this, I'm just curious to know how, how do we actually begin to feel safe in our bodies? Because something that almost infuriates me on my healing journey is that I feel like I'm constantly at war, like conscious mm -hmm. versus unconscious. Like I can talk to myself and say like, I'm fine. This is an okay situation. There is no threat here. I'm okay. But there is something unconsciously inside of me that disagrees with that. And I've had a hard time, you know, it's on and off my journey, but blending and coalescing with that part and meeting that part. But it almost seems like this part of me, and I've told Gina before, it actually feels like a literal baby. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it feels like a baby that I can't, nothing I do makes this baby feel better. And I empathize sometimes with mothers, even though I've never been a mother, mm -hmm. that you you feed the baby, you make the baby go to sleep, you you do all of these things and it's still crying. And that's how I sometimes feel towards myself. Like mm. I'm taking such good care of you. Like I'm doing all of the practices, but you still don't trust me. You still feel unsafe. And so what has been successful for you and your clients in terms of really establishing that sense of safety so that we can move about the world with without these coping mechanisms or at least at the severity that we're using them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And there are so many ways to do this. And I think different things work for different people, depending on our history. One piece that has been really supportive in my experience, and I, I relate to your experience, Sam, of, of having this kind of inner, <laughs> inner little one that, that shows up. Um, and, you know, for me, it would show up with really, really big emotions that just felt so overwhelming. And, you know, would that would just take over, essentially. Yeah. And, you know, an element of prenatal bonding, um, I think, applies in this situation. And in prenatal bonding, there's this idea that we communicate with the baby, but we also listen to what the baby has to say. Mm. And sometimes when we do some like inner child type of work, we forget that listening part. And there's mm. the sense of like, I'm here. I hear you. I love you. <laughs> but there, totally. there sometimes isn't that sense of like, what do you need from me right now? 
Mm. And how can I support you? Right. And sometimes having that dialogue within ourselves can be really, really helpful. Mm. And, you know, my, I think my, the second part of my answer to this is a little bit of an unpopular opinion in some ways. I think we live in a culture that's so focused on the individual and, and we are so focused on being self healers and we want to heal for ourselves. If we have early ruptures, we benefit so much from healing in relationship and mm. finding a therapist or a coach that can really be that caregiver that we needed in many ways mm. is the sometimes the most healing experience that we might have. And, you know, when we are coming into the world, self-regulation, so self-soothing is not available. We need that co-nourishment, mm. co-regulation. And when we start healing those younger parts of us, it's the same thing. <laughs> we need yeah. that nervous system to yeah. co-regulate with. And that mm. can be so helpful to find people that can support us mm. with that. It's hard to do on our own. Yeah. Oh. I love that you said that because I think um, for me, like, I mean, I think we all have, of course, some some form of a mother wound. And mm -hmm. um, I think for my clients, one of the biggest pieces of feedback that I tend to get is that it's somehow like having this motherly energy through the coaching relationship mm -hmm. creates this template almost of what that mothering kind of support can feel like. And so much of my journey has really been reparenting myself and being the kind of mother figure that I need within. But it's so interesting because I will name that when I do the inner child work, I've never gone back to the womb. Mm -hmm. I feel like, Sam, you have. I, I feel have. like, you, yeah. And you were like almost like rebirth, but like all of my inner child stuff is like, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight years old. But I'm so curious now to go back into that prenatal stage because, um, I just, again, like observe my daughter and can kind of see like the way that she needed soothing. And I also want to name for any parent out there, there's so much contradicting advice about even how to help kids fall asleep, like the whole like crying it out method. And that just did not no. sit well with me. Um, but a lot of other parents I know, they're like, it worked and they were fine. And there's also so much like shaming when it comes to um, responding to our children. You know, I think I remember distinctly this one I don't even want to call her a friend. She was just somebody that uh, that was at this same barbecue thing with me. And she was like, you know, don't don't pick up your baby every time it cries. You know, it's trying to manipulate you. And I was like, what? Like, it can't no, manipulate don't me. That. They don't do that. She needs something. But then I felt judgment for every time I picked up my baby because they were like, wow, you're just like spoiling her and all of that kind of stuff. And so I just wanted to, I guess, normalize for any parent how – hard it is to know. And that's obviously why I wanted you to come on so that we can have some um, guidance and some support when it comes to the way that we want to show up for our kids and the way that we naturally feel called to kind of care for them. Mm -hmm. um, and on the flip side of that, I guess the other thing I want to say is that sometimes when we didn't get that, it's hard for us to give that mm -hmm. because there's an element of, well, I didn't need that and I was fine. But you're not actually fine. It's the coping strategy that is making you okay, you know? So yeah, I would just love for you to maybe um, touch on that. Yeah. And I appreciate you naming that. It's hard to do something that we haven't been modeled. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's really hard. And some of us don't have access to a caregiver figure that we admire or that we resonate with or that we yeah. want to emulate with our own children. And that can, you know, I think that can be accessible in different ways. I've seen people find this through characters on TV. Like mm. it can be as simple as that. Who's energy, right? Some people have really connect with spiritual figures or, or deities and, and that energy, like that motherly nourishing energy can be really helpful and really inspiring. But it's mm. hard. It's hard to do something we haven't been modeled. And truthfully, I, I love that you named that because if we provide a child something that we haven't had, what we're also going to tap into is grief. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, like the, the, the sense of like, yeah, I didn't get that. I wish I would have gotten that. Oh, my God. <laughs> that actually just recently happened to me because, um, yeah, my daughter has been going to these um, K-pop dance classes. 
and you know seeing her fully expressed in herself um it is really interesting what comes up for me the the initial thing is just me observing her and just loving on her and just observing just how herself she is but then the follow up to that is just the stark awareness that i never got that mm -hmm. And so it can be really painful because as you said, as you're giving this, you're also grieving your own, um, not even loss of it, but just the fact that you never had it. So yeah, thank you for naming that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know my mom experienced a lot of grief too in giving yeah. me a lot of the things that she couldn't have. And I don't know if she knew how to process that. Um, it, it honestly just came out a lot in like irritation sometimes, mm -hmm. right, um, towards me, which I think at some point I came to understand. I, I was old enough, not when I was like before 10 years old, but post double digits. I was kind of aware of like, oh, I think you wished you got to do this too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can just see like how, how so many of our needs not being met lead to dysfunction within our own lives and our family systems. And still as adults, we are confused about how to meet our needs. I mean, that's the number one question I get asked whenever I'm struggling. What do I need? But I don't know sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I feel like there's this wailing baby inside because I'm just like, I don't know like what it needs, right? Um, and I think too, it's been difficult because it's obviously gonna be something different every time. And I'm yeah. kind of trying to find like a framework that works every time. I'm like, yeah. okay, when this happens, <laughs> apply X. Um, but it's it's such a it's such an upward healing journey and it's gonna look different at each turn. But um, what are some practices that have been the most helpful for you? And yeah, I'm just kind of curious to know maybe some success stories of your clients who have maybe experienced a lot of complex trauma and that being within the womb and outside of the womb and how they've been able to heal themselves because this this sense of non-safety from birth, I can just see has so many ramifications for our later life. And it's so heartbreaking to me that I most of us just blame ourselves and who we are as people yeah. for a lot of these things. But the reason why I was getting so emotional like 10 minutes ago, maybe five minutes ago, I was like crying because I just realized we we don't choose to to feel these things. And yeah. Um, yeah, the coping mechanisms are just the ones that work in the moment. And so, yeah, what has been the most healing for yourself and your clients and bringing that sense of safety back into themselves? Mm. Yeah. Um, I think – for me personally, I think my own journey is so tied into my work in this way. If if I want to show up and in attachment work, we call it a secure base. And yeah. and the idea of this is um the parent, you know, in a in a parent child relationship, the parent being a secure base that the child can can feel safety with, but then can explore the world and then come back, right? This like safe haven. And if mm. I want to be that for my clients and allow them to really move through those those younger parts and those younger pieces that are coming up i had to do my own work around this so i could embody that for others and really having people for me because my history is more so a history of neglect than it was a history of abuse that can that can make a difference as well mm -hmm. i just want to name that mm -hmm. because that was part of my story i needed a lot of validation I needed, I didn't need the coach or the therapist that was like, you're not doing it right. No, you shouldn't do this. I needed right. somebody who was like, yeah, it's okay if you're angry. It's okay mm. if you're sad, mm -hmm. right? And having that that mirroring of like, oh, I'm not doing anything wrong. Because as babies, we have this su such a strong like shutdown type of response because of the state and how um, undeveloped, underdeveloped our nervous system is. And that mm. shame response is so closely tied to that sort of shutdown. So I had yeah. already so much shame. I needed somebody to like reflect back the goodness, the things that were working, the things that were okay about me. And because I've had this, I can now do it for others. Another mm. piece that's really helpful, truly in healing this is touch work, having mm. support through touch. For those of us who had challenging life experiences early on, we either need a lot of touch and we're under touched in that way, or we've made associations, right? In cases of abuse, touch wasn't safe and mm. we get to rewire that. 
And it's one of our first languages. It's, it's something that contributes so much to our development that having, you know, body work, I do touch therapy, different types of work in this way can also be really, really helpful to our nervous system. Mm. Mm. So for touch work, does that have to be something that you're physically there for? Or like, do you coach people through like how they can support themselves through that? Yeah. So there are different ways to go about it. There are different modalities. The way that I do it, um, I don't have people necessarily do it for themselves because um, I don't want them to have to do any work. <laughs> if we think of it from a younger part perspective, right? right? Someone I'm, would do it for you. <laughs> exactly. So what we do when I work online is we bring our attention to certain parts of their bodies together. Mm. And that can be, for example, um, the um, parts of our nervous system that are involved in our threat response. So I do a lot of touch work with the adrenal glands, right? Cortisol, <laughs> that's all related. The yeah. adrenal glands, the brainstem. We do that with the heart. There are different ways to go about this, but we bring our attention together in this way to bring Ooh, support. I can totally see that being really, really supportive because um, most of, you know, both of our coaching work is done online and um, really just to go even back to what you were saying earlier, just having a space where somebody's letting you know that's okay that you feel that. I think some of the biggest breakthroughs that our clients have had is, wait, I'm allowed to be mad about this? And it's like, yes. It's like, I'm allowed to feel sad and shame about this? It's like, yes. Mm -hmm. And even going back, Sam, to what you said, how sometimes it's like, what do you need? Like, I've given you everything you need. Um, I had this really big awakening with my own inner child healing where she actually responded back to me like, I don't, I don't know what I need. And I, it's actually making her feel unsafe that I keep asking her, what do you need? Yeah. Because it kind of creates this like, am I supposed to know what I need? And now it again comes back to blame of, wow, I don't even know what I need. And something that's been really supportive for me personally is just literally holding the space for the emotion, just like you would for the baby. Like as an infant, you're not like actually asking the baby, what do you need? Right. But sometimes all they need is to cry and have you like pat their back and for however long it takes. And so giving myself that space to feel my anxiety and my nervousness and my fear and my shame, all of that, and just holding myself. So for me personally, I do a lot of touch work myself. Um, and to your point, I think experimentation gets to be a really loving act of seeing like what does feel good to me. For some people, it's bringing their hand to heart. For some people, it's like, you know, rocking in bed um, or even like in fetal position with their arms on their shoulders. For me, it's been very supportive to have my hands on my face. There's something about that that feels so like just cupping my face and just holding me and just looking at myself sometimes even in the mirror and just letting myself cry without trying to fix it mm. has been something that's been um, very, very supportive in my healing and for my clients because it's this needing to fix it that sometimes creates more suffering um, because there's this added pressure of a timeline of like needing to hurry up and get through it um, versus the energy of taking as long as you need. Yeah. Yeah. And that urgency is felt, right? Whether it's in ourselves or with a child, that sense of urgency impacts the, the field of, of the relationship so much. So it's yes. beautiful that you get to offer yourself that. And, you know, I love what you said about the rocking. Rocking is a really soothing motion for us, for our nervous system. That can be so powerful in, in any sort of reparenting, but also for, for folks who, who have kids, right? Like that rocking motion, so supportive. And, you know, if I kind of circle back to our conversation around practices, I know cold showers are all the craze right now, but you know, warmth, warmth is mm -hmm. so healing for us, for those young parts of us. Many of us with challenging early life experiences, we live and freeze. For me, I was cold mm -hmm. all the time. My feet, my yes. hands, always cold. I didn't need more cold. <laughs> I had that, <laughs> right? So that warmth baths, right? Um, any sort of like, you know, any um, heating pads or anything like that can be like mm. so healing on the back, yeah. right? On our, on our, on our necks, like anything that's so helpful as a baby. We need that warmth too. It's mm. so funny because I like sometimes swaddle myself. <laughs> 
<laughs> because I remember seeing my my daughter as like a little burrito and I was like that looks so cozy and so sometimes I just want to go into that like blanket and just really like tuck myself in and feel that closeness and actually something that Sam and I have chatted about with her clothing choices is she really likes tight fitting clothing mm -hmm. because it it brings that comfort um like my daughter is the same way and she's really regulates through touch and um, she's very cuddly very affectionate and so I notice that she prefers wearing like tighter fit clothing like in pants because I think it helps her to feel safety um, with that close proximity to the clothes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And, you know, not to, to make too much meaning out of that, because um, I don't know everybody's individual experience, but something that I see a lot, and that was definitely true for me, is that I had a low sense of proprioception, which is our ability to locate our bodies in space. And that's very much related to our development. But this, any sort of practice that we call, we would call it like a containment type of practice, like that burrito or those tight clothes, right? I can feel a sense of the container of my body. Mm -hmm. And that brings us a sense of sometimes where I am, who I am, right? It's like, oh, I can feel myself now. And, you know, for me, something that was showing up a lot, I liked to have really tight hugs. I was like, squeeze me, squeeze me. That was one of the ways Amazing. where I could feel myself. Yeah, this is actually so interesting. I, I'm kind of curious to know more about this because, yeah, as we're talking, I have like a really tight, long sleeve turtleneck on that's like squeezing my torso and my arms, but I like it because I can literally feel my arms that's yeah. so strange I just realized it as you said it mm -hmm. and yes I'm someone who definitely feels healed and loved through touch it's a hundred percent my love language and it's funny because when me and Gina's daughter get together we're just like literally like nuzzling each other the entire time but um <laughs> I'm the same way I really like those tight hugs and so I'm kind of confused about this this proprioception piece and being able to sense ourselves and how that creates safety because yeah, I'm just kind of curious what could have contributed to my sense of not being able to feel my body because I will say one of my greatest journeys, and I think this is shared amongst me and most of humanity, but is moving from living in my mind into mm -hmm. my heart, right? Yeah. That journey that we, we all go through. Mm -hmm. And I often feel at times just like we've talked about this, a floating head. Mm -hmm. Like I don't really have limbs. I know I do, but I have to really, really focus on them, which is actually why I'm so active because I feel like when I'm physically active, that's the only time I really mm -hmm. know that I'm in here and I can like feel myself moving. But yeah, right. I, I'm really curious to know more about that felt sense of ourselves and what can damage that proprioception. Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, our brains develop in platforms. And one of the earliest um, brain structures that are developed, one of the earliest is the brainstem, which is this sense of like, am I safe? Am I not safe? For some of us, if that was so present, if that was kind of the priority, it can affect other pieces of our development. It's almost like these platforms that are that come after that are not as easy to access because we're, we're still here on the am I safe or am I not safe? And that can include um, that can include our sensory systems, so our proprioception, so that sense of feeling ourselves in space, mm -hmm. also our vestibular system, so feeling what's moving, what's not moving, right? Mm. That can be, and those are all ways that we orient ourselves, that we understand what's happening, where am mm -hmm. I, who am I, right, in this space. So it has such a big impact on our sense of self as a whole. And there are many different ways that we get to work with that. And that's also part of the work that I do with some folks and is kind of working on those platforms and, and building those sensory system and supporting them into emerging so it feels more integrated. Because what can also happen is that when that happens to us, when those sensory systems are not fully online or, or we're just working really hard, there's just this sense for me, for example, I would go to Costco, right? lights, noise, all the things. I would be so overwhelmed, right? Yeah. Or I would be so sensitive in different environments. My vestibular system was really, was really wonky. So car sickness, motion sickness, all those things, right? So that can have an impact on just our day-to-day -day lives and how much 
you know, how much energy it requires for us to just function, to just move through the world. Mm. Yeah, that brings a lot of compassion to to the heart because, yeah, I think I hear a lot of people wonder to themselves, like, why is just living my life so difficult? Like, <laughs> yeah. And I, I feel that way a lot when my – it feels like my nervous system is being hijacked or my body's being hijacked in some way where it really does feel like just daily – living can be really difficult. And I'm kind of like you, Lorianne, where I've oscillated between like really high functioning to low functioning. And I'm trying to basically live in that sweet middle, which is actually quite uncomfortable for me because mm -hmm. it kind of feels like I'm not doing anything. Um, but I, my mantra these days is like, something is better than nothing. So I just keep doing mm -hmm. these little small some things to stay in that zone. Um, but yeah, this has just been so illuminating for for me for so many reasons and Gina too, I'm assuming, because I think there are just so many things that we can't explain with our thoughts, right? Because I want to know the reason for everything. Yeah. Like, I'm like, what, what is the reason behind that? What is the why behind that? And what is the origin point of that? And I think what's so funny is the part of me that's trying to seek for those answers, that part of me wasn't online when these mm -hmm. things happened. I think yeah. that's kind of what I'm piecing together. So me searching in this endless maze for an origin point or the part when this narrative began, that part of me wasn't even active, but my body was. I was alive and I was conscious and I was feeling sensations. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly there's just so much, yeah, there's just so much space being held for the fact that I didn't have control over my sense of safety because you can't as a baby. And so I guess I would just like for you to speak on that a little bit more about how we don't have the ability, right, to to self-soothe and find safety as babies. We we rely so much on the caretaker. Mm -hmm. um, and just curious to know your thoughts about how, of course, that obviously impacts our development. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you um, naming it in that way. You know, our caregivers, they're human. <laughs> they're human. They have different capacities. Some caregivers don't have the capacity to hold space for big emotions. Some have other life things going on, right? And depending on people's positionality in society, sometimes there's financial stress. Sometimes there's mm -hmm. really real threats like racism or, or things that they're facing day to day that is taking so much survival energy. And that's important to put that into context. I think it's important to have a awareness around, you know, it's not because caregivers are defective they have their own concerns and sometimes that impact their capacity to care for a child, right? And I think this is also part of the work that we get to do as adults looking back is seeing the humanity in our caregivers. That can be also really helpful. At least it was for me. You know, there's this sense of like, what if there was nothing wrong with me? What if there was just yeah. all this stuff going on? What does that change yeah. in my own experience as I feel into that, right? Mm. Yeah, because I think a lot of times what can sometimes stunt our healing is is knowing that it was hard for our parents, and then we kind of um, feel like any any um, expression of how hard it was for us negates like how hard they worked, and so then it kind of stunts us because we don't want to name how hard it was for us um, because it was also so hard for them. But I think what you're speaking to um, as another layer of this is having compassion and opening up to seeing that, yeah, it wasn't our fault. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because I'm, there's something wrong with me or that I was such a burden or any of those things. Um, but truly that was just the circumstances and that they ultimately did the best that they could. Um, it's so interesting because, you know, I obviously would consider myself to be a conscious parent, but I mean, I still do a lot of things unconsciously that I'm still repairing um, within myself and within my relationship with my daughter. But I'm just thinking about my birth story and even my like pregnancy. My pregnancy was awful. I was sick the entire time, just nauseous, couldn't sleep. I was just uncomfortable the whole time. And then comes the labor and I'm not going to get into all the details because it's quite graphic and gory, but um, basically I started hemorrhaging blood um, excessively to the point where I basically fainted in the bathroom, hit my head on a wall and I was like unconscious for for many hours. And um, I just remember waking up for 
because I was kind of in and out of consciousness. And I remember just all the doctors rushing towards me. They threw me onto the bed. And um, I just remember opening my eyes for like a couple seconds and looking at my husband and just knowing my daughter was not in the room. And I honestly thought I was going to die. And there was so much fear in my body coming off of just this immense joy of giving birth. Um, It's just so crazy what we go through in labor. Let me just also just say to any person that has um, gone through this process, it's a lot. And anyways, you know, my daughter was in the hallway. We had that separation. I was also then healing and recovering. And, um, you know, that wasn't either of our faults, Mm -hmm. you know? And so to even name, like, like I had so much guilt and I was like, oh no, I have to like breastfeed her right away. And there's all of these different pressures, but I think to just point to, um, yeah, sometimes it's not anybody's fault at all. And it just is the circumstance, but, you know, in my position, I think I've always felt this kind of guilt because I didn't get to attach with her as much as I wanted to. You know, they talk so much about skin to skin contact as soon as the baby's out. And I wasn't able to do that right away. And even my husband was in the room with me. Um, And so there has been this like thin layer of guilt for me of is that maybe adding to um, I'm just going to start getting emotional. Like, is that adding to her? Um, anxious attachment to me and even mine to her. You know, I think she's getting to an age where she's getting older, becoming more independent, and I'm finding myself like clinging to her. And so I just wonder how much of that birth trauma um, is contributing to that. And also what would be your suggestions in how we can repair um, some of those initial imprints that um, the mother and the baby go through? Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. That was such a such a frightening experience. And I, I'm sure that a lot of people will resonate hearing your story around this. Um, you know, one thing that we speak to a lot in, in birth psychology and prenatal psychology is the experience of baby and, and that being sometimes different than the experience that mom has giving birth or, or the birthing parent. And, you know, I think it's interesting to notice how um, that might have felt for her in some ways, mm-hmm. right? And it might be a conversation. Some some kids are very enlightened in this way and have a lot to share. Others don't as much and that's okay too. But knowing that, you know, that experience what was frightening for you in some ways and that's huge and and that might have been frightening for her in other ways birth mm. is such a huge transition that we don't mm-hmm. necessarily acknowledge we go from warmth <laughs> right this kind of like you know watery environment it's warm it's dark <laughs> and then it's like we're out the lights all the people it's such a big transition and mm-hmm. and you know in, in, in birth, in, in that process, you might have been the reference point. That's the voice that she knows, that she's heard all those months in your womb, right? Mm. And I think, you know, uh, truthfully, I think having awareness that that might have been a rupture is already a huge piece because in our yeah. culture, we don't even acknowledge that. It's like, we're fine. It's fine. <laughs> right? mm. And I think that's an opportunity as well. That's an opportunity as well. And, you know, sometimes moving through our own process when I work with parents who've had challenging births, healing that process for ourselves, allow us to then be more open to hearing what their experience might be like even now, right? Mm. So, because there might be a lot to process. Like for you, there was this experience. For others, it could be anesthesia. For others, it's... um, you know, examination without consent from doctors, right? There's such a range of what can happen that would make birth traumatic in some ways. Mm. Wow. I'm just kind of realizing right now, I don't think I ever have really processed Mm. what happened. I think my emphasis has been so heavy on her um, naturally, um, because of course, you know, I always focus on her, but um, yeah, I don't think I really have process. I've talked about it a lot. Um, but even for my husband, I mean, it was, he like says this kind of as a joke and I'm always like, you can't say that, but he says in some ways that it was harder for him because he had to like watch it, you know, Mm -hmm. and he had to like witness and he was so afraid of losing me and becoming a, a solo dad. Um, and so, you know, I think so much of it is also like processing like his experience as well, but what are some ways that for any, um, 
anyone who's given birth that has had something traumatic, like what, where can we start in um, processing like mm-hmm. what happened? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably a little biased <laughs> in my answer because it's what I do, but I think um, somatic work, somatic therapy, especially somatic experiencing I have found is really helpful for people mm-hmm. in moving through mm-hmm. birth trauma there's birth is a physiological process right it's not a medical event it can there can be medical things that right, happen right. but it's a physiological process and that can create real ruptures with our bodies our sense of trust in our bodies and their ability to move through big stuff yeah and mm. you know we get to repair that within ourselves and sometimes as i said for some people there's still some anesthesia to process There are people who haven't fully processed anesthesia and that can show up in dissociation, disconnection, right? And in talking even about the experience. So I am definitely a little biased, but also I think there's value in exploring this from a body-based perspective. And we get to take Mm -hmm. our time, right? This is not, it's not something that we, that we rush. We kind of break it down in little bits and pieces. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. 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 Well, Lorianne, I really just want to lean on your expertise in this area and just kind of ask you, what are the most surprising things that you learned when you began to study neonatal psychology and consciousness at conception or preconception? What are things that, what are some things that blew your mind? Yeah, I love that question. Honestly, the thing that I love the most and that I keep coming back to is the opportunity that we have in, Mm. in having this knowledge and this wisdom. Like, we can see this as, oh my goodness, babies are conscious so early. That's so stressful. We need to watch everything we do. But what if we were to see this as, I get to connect with my child even before conception. I get to connect with my child as they're growing. I get to establish a relationship with this child, right? Even Mm. in the womb and start creating space to listen. And that's something that to me shifted something very profound because I started thinking about what if a lot more children were to feel safe in the womb? What if a lot more people were to come into the world feeling heard, feeling seen, feeling welcome? What kind of world would we be creating if that was the case, right? And I think that's really the opportunity that we have in in sharing that research and that that content. I just think it's it's life-changing, really. Wow. Yeah. I had a very deep experience where I was in the womb and um, I feel like I'm going to get emotional as I talk about this. I cannot explain to you how afraid I was. I was so scared. Yeah, I was like really scared to um, like come into the world mm-hmm. and like not be liked if I came into the world or like not know what to do once I got there. Mm-hmm. And I wonder like how many how many of us have touched that em- emotion or experience Um prior to literally Earthside, that that innate primal sense of fear and maybe not being liked. I remember that so clearly, which seems so crazy. Like, how could I even know that like being liked is even a thing, right? But I think already in my bones and in my genetics, I know that love and belonging is important. Mm-hmm. And I was already afraid that I wasn't going to experience it. So yeah, that mm-hmm. makes me emotional. Yeah. 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 And I see I see your hand on your heart as you're sharing this and it just feels so soothing for me to watch yeah. as you're naming that. Mm. Yeah. You've really touched my heart today, Lorianne. Mm. Just thinking about all of our um yeah, all of those early experiences that we don't have consciousness consciousness of, but certainly um we were aware mm-hmm. um on some level and they and they deeply impacted us and so much of my life I've just I think I've just blamed myself for the things that I do or don't do and I feel like I'm at a phase in my healing where I can almost see like I would never do that on purpose like yeah. these things yeah. that I do to cope like I'm not choosing them like something inside of me feels the need to do that in order to feel safe and um yeah it's been a wild wild spiraling journey <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate you naming that. And I think, you know, what I'm also hearing is those coping strategies can be challenging and can feel like sometimes they're not like, this is not who I want to be, or this is not how I want to behave. 
And yeah. the opportunity, I think, in engaging in this work is that the more we can find regulation in our nervous system, the more those coping strategies just fall away because I'm able yeah. to be with what's here, right? I have enough capacity to feel the big emotion without reaching for my phone to scroll because I need to self-soothe, right? How many of us do yeah. this, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I actually caught myself doing that the other day. I actually got a stressful text message mm -hmm. from someone and instead of dealing with that, I just noticed myself immediately close it and go to Instagram and just start scrolling. And my partner actually asked me what I was doing. And I looked up and I said, I'm distracting myself because I feel anxious. <laughs> like I actually mm. noticed myself in the moment doing that. Mm. And um, yeah, and I just think about how many people are doing that unconsciously and then maybe waking up from that and thinking, oh my God, how did I spend so much time just like scrolling on my phone? Mm. But what I see is like, that was the only thing that felt good for you in the last hour. <laughs> and so, yeah, just creating compassion for that because actually since limiting my phone usage, because I actually was intentional this year about having my little timer set because I was looking at my usage and I was like, that's a lot. So my, my timer is set for my social media. And so across all apps, so like my TikTok or like my Instagram, it's literally one hour. And it's so crazy ever since enacting this one hour limit, I noticed myself kind of feeling a little bit like what do I do? <laughs> I, I've noticed myself feel a little bit like, oh, like interesting. This is like the moment where I would feel kind of uncomfortable with myself and I would just reach for that. And it's obviously so socially acceptable. No one would like look at me in a waiting room and think like, oh, that person's scrolling on TikTok. That's so weird, right? It's actually weirder now that I'm just sitting there looking <laughs> at the wall. Yeah. But I've had to just expand constantly my capacity for like being with sensations that feel awkward in myself mm -hmm. or even bad. I just, I just literally sit there and it's honestly so uncomfortable that I can just understand so deeply why I do all the things that I do mm -hmm. to avoid them and why everyone else does those things to avoid them. So mm -hmm. yeah, this feels like such a, such a compassion driven conversation. Yeah. And I, I love that you said that because I think it's, it's so relatable for so many of us. We just don't have the tools to, to, to self-regulate. We don't know how. So we reach for the phone. We reach for the Netflix. We over-exercise. All those things because we don't know what else to do. That's true for so many folks, right? Yeah. And that can be part of the process of noticing that, oh, that's I'm noticing that that's a tool for me. And how do mm -hmm. I continue expanding my capacity over time to be, as you were saying, with those emotion, those sensations, right? Mm -hmm. And finding I think those... also, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, I think also the conditioning is that we're supposed to do something mm -hmm. about how we feel, right? I That's how I was conditioned. And so I definitely was the over-exerciser, like food restrictor, hard worker, like busy work creator, just because I felt like if I was feeling anything that felt uncomfortable or wrong, I was taught that there was something you could do about that. Like, yeah. okay, well, don't just like sit there, like do something, like go for a run. And I, I did a lot of these things for so many years. And then it took me like almost a decade to realize that I didn't actually feel better when I did them. Mm -hmm. And if I did, it was always just very short and temporary. But um, I'm curious to hear what you would say to someone who's been taught their whole life to quote unquote do something about their emotions because what I'm experiencing is that to not do anything, it actually does feel really unsafe. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of right now playing around with doing a little bit of things like mm -hmm. because that's the way I'm I guess titrating my experience of being with it because literally for me to just sit when I feel uncomfortable is like I literally feel like I'm being harmed. Mm -hmm. Like that experience does not feel okay for me. So I need to kind of like do something. Like yesterday I noticed, oh, like I feel weird, but I'm going to like do laundry. Mm -hmm. And so I, it was like a small thing to just kind of like get myself moving. But yeah, I'm kind of curious what you would say to someone on that journey of learning to expand when they've been taught to do things to avoid how they feel. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm, a, I'm just asking for myself. But anyone who also resonates with feeling like they need to do something about how they feel because otherwise they're like perpetuating it or making it worse. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's an important piece here is it's hard for us to know how to be with our emotions when either we haven't been modeled 
that, right? M- many of us don't have caregivers who were with their emotions or yeah. we haven't had people be with us in that emotion and sit with yeah. us with that feeling. So we learned how to do it. And that's mm-hmm. challenging. And that's important to acknowledge when it's part of our history. And I love really what you were naming around titration. I think that's key here. Because if we just overwhelm ourselves, what I see sometimes is like people who are like, <laughs> I, I, I don't feel my feelings. I'm going to go into this meditation retreat. And then it's like they come back and they're like, I'm never sitting with my feelings again. <laughs> right? It was too much. And it was too yeah. much too soon. And that's not everyone's experience, of course, but it can be the experience. And, you know, what I like to bring in as an awareness is, and I'll take Sam, I'll take your laundry experience, because I think it's a really, really good one. It's, you know, noticing how long or, or how can I stay with what's here? How do I know that I'm meeting my edge? And that feels like enough. And if I go mm. to, you know, do laundry for a while, because that feels like it's helping. Can I notice that it's helping? Mm. Can I give myself permission to feel like, oh, okay, I'm moving a little bit. I'm, I'm bringing my awareness outside of myself for a minute. That feels good. My shoulders are coming down. I feel less tension. Sometimes just giving ourselves permission to also notice like, oh, like I feel more settled now. That helps in some ways. Mm. That can help mm. us yeah. too. It's interesting because I'm actually noticing how intuitive I am because it wasn't a conscious thought. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to go do laundry now because I'm really like feeling a lot of heaviness. Like mm-hmm. I just... I just, I don't know, like I literally just gathered it and did it. (laughs) And then after I came upstairs, because I'm I'm living in an Airbnb right now where I have to take the laundry down. So it's like a whole ordeal. But (laughs) when I came upstairs, I like kind of like sat on the couch and was like, kind of like, okay, that's done. And I was like, hmm. Like I didn't really notice until after. Mm -hmm. Like that felt kind of good. And then I was like, okay, now I'm gonna take a shower. So it kind of like jump started my, my sense of motion. But also there is a sense of like, oh, so doing something about it like did help, mm-hmm. right? It almost kind of feels a little bit like I'm also reinforcing the old pattern. So I kind of struggle with that. I'm like, was that, I do feel better, but was that the call for me to sit with that longer? And I think this, I could go in circles around this in my head, right? The right way, the wrong way, but I think we're just learning. So mm-hmm. I, I do feel proud, I guess, that in that moment I did what I needed and I did feel better. But yeah, sometimes I wonder, I think I also suffer a lot from conditioning that's like, get it all out. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, Gina even says this, like, let it all out, right? And so I felt like yesterday when I was doing the laundry, almost like, oh, like it's not all out. But I really could not be with it all coming Mm -hmm. out. So I had to do what I needed to do. And there's probably still some there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is because I was crying today. (laughs) Yeah, and I think getting it all out means like getting out getting it all out that you can get out in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. Going back to that titration piece and and knowing that um, even the awareness that you have of I don't think it's all out and letting that be okay. Um, You know, I'm just thinking about as babies how we help them soothe themselves. Um, Like my daughter started sucking her thumb and at some point that becomes more damaging for them than soothing, right? Like as a parent, you're like, you know, that could be really damaging for their teeth or, you know, their jaw, um, but even soothers, right? And I just think about for kids who needed soothers or needed a bottle for soothing, and then the parent is trying to wean them off of that, mm-hmm. potentially when they weren't ready. And I think sometimes like we do that to ourselves where we're expecting ourselves to soothe without that soothing tool and get taking that away too soon, mm-hmm. you know? So I think one of the biggest things, I mean, met, I mean, for those of you who don't know, Lorianne was one of my mentors as I was studying to become a somatic coach. Um, one of the things I learned from you so deeply was to go slow. You know, I remember even having a session with you and I'd be like, okay, I want to talk about blah, 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 blah. And I would list like 14 things. And you're like, let's, let's start with the first thing you said. And I'm like, but way back there, <laughs> you know, and, and stretching this out, letting it be slow. And I love how you spoke to how this gets to be an opportunity, you know, to heal, to repair, to ultimately to get to know ourselves and to know what is soothing and to also know that what's soothing to us is also going to evolve mm-hmm. as we evolve. And so what worked last month might not quote unquote work now because you're a different you right now. You know, there's different triggers, circumstances, different emotions alive. And so um, I think from my own journey and obviously the clients that I help, um, it really has been such an intentional practice 
to slow it down. I almost feel like it's like you're like zooming into it and kind of almost like stretching it out into a bigger canvas um, and getting a little bit more, I don't want to say micro, but yeah, slowing it down enough so that you can see those mm -hmm. little micro emotions or those micro soothing things that you could, you could potentially need. Um, yeah. 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 And that's such an important piece. You know, that pacing in our healing process, survival yeah. energy is urgency. And, and mm. when we're activated, we need to get all this. I need to figure this out. I need to heal this ASAP. Like that's the energy of it. And for many of us with early trauma or early challenges, um, that's kind of our MO. There's this sense of like, I need to do this. I need to fix this. There's something wrong. And, you know, I think there's so much value in slowing down and, and really looking at it in bits and pieces, Trauma can happen from commission or omission, right? So that can be something that happens to us, which is usually that definition that we hear everywhere, too much, too fast, too soon. In which case, mm -hmm. of course, we want to slow down, right? Because that's the opposite of what happened, that traumatic mm -hmm. experience. But for others, that trauma is by omission, meaning that it's the things that didn't happen. And if for us, that thing that didn't happen was um, connection or love or support, that's an unfamiliar experience to our nervous system, meaning that we don't know if it's yeah. safe yet. So we need to introduce it slowly or else we can send ourselves way back into overwhelm, right? So that slowing down piece is so valuable for so many of us. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because um, I noticed myself even two days ago, like I wanted to do a deep meditation and like get in touch with like one of these like protector parts. And I was like, I could feel myself being like, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to meet them. And then we're going to like, we're going <laughs> to, exactly. we're, we're going to connect and then we're going to be fine. And it's like, <laughs> I've given myself 15 minutes to do this entire thing. And it's just, it's just so funny um, how I even apply a sense of urgency there. And also just in my life, like as I slow down, I'm noticing all the areas where I created opportunity for urgency. Um, and I used to do it all the time. And I would, I would purposefully wake up with not enough time mm -hmm. to get ready. And like, I know it, but that sense of like running around and like drying my hair and like trying to get a bite in, it's like that felt normal for me for so long. Um, yeah. Even though it didn't feel that good, mm -hmm. I, I felt at least like, ah, I know how this goes. Like later on, I'll kind of crash, but I kind of knew the cycle. And right now I'm learning a new pace, which doesn't include – urgency and I don't really know what's on the other side yet that's kind of how I feel I'm like is this gonna turn out like I don't know what the results of this new pace and behavior um, will look like and I think that is the other side of healing that people don't recognize is that it you're going into the unknown mm -hmm. like you're literally completely changing your patterns and so who you will be what your life will look like it's quite mysterious but that's also a positive thing if you so choose to believe it Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's such a great point, right? We change our baseline. And and what I was hearing and what you were sharing is that, you know, when sometimes we have behaviors that we can't fully explain, and those behaviors keep us at a certain baseline. For me, an example of that was overbooking my schedule. Overwhelm was my baseline. I'm going to overbook myself and be stressed out. That I know how that goes. <laughs> yeah. I'm mm -hmm. keeping yeah. myself right there because slowing down was so scary. Right. Mm -hmm. And and when we, you know, when we move through our healing process, we're changing that nervous system baseline, but we have to do that slowly or else our body are, is like, what's what is going on? Is that dangerous right now? Right. So we yeah. change it little by little. Like I see that as like a thermostat. We, we you know, we turn it down one degree at a time. Yeah. Um, yeah. It very much is like weaning a baby. Mm -hmm. Like it, it is really gradual. Um, and that gets to be our experience when we are just there for ourselves. And it really does come down to treating ourselves like a wee little baby, know. you know, don't no agenda. I think that's the other thing I really learned through my, my coaching was just not having an agenda, even with like our healing. It sounds like Sam, you're <laughs> That example you just shared sounds so like, I'm going to book an appointment for myself to heal. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm booking in for 1.15 PM and I'm going to pop out and I'll be fine. And um, it's, you know, this, um, 
it's a nice ideology to believe in, right? But then it's also so disappointing when we get out of that and we still feel that thing inside of us. And so what's the expectation? Exactly. Yeah. Having that expectation where the expectation really is however long it takes. Mm -hmm. You know, if there is going to be an expectation, it's that it's going to take however long it takes. And I think one of the most loving things we can offer ourselves is that time and that spaciousness um, of saying like, I will be here as long as it takes. And I remember doing that with my daughter, like, oh my God, her sleep was so awful for over two years. And she, again, she was so attached to me. And because I felt so guilty, I was like, I must do whatever I can to help her. But it was so interesting witnessing the way that I helped to ease her into sleeping on her own. Um, What felt safe to her was just knowing that I was physically close to her door so in the beginning it was like she wanted me right beside her crib then it was like okay now I'm going to stand at the door but as soon as I became out of sight that's when she just couldn't do it so then I started talking to her through the door and I'd say I'm right here I'm right here and then every once in a while she would check she'd be like mom and I'd have to like run over to the door and I'm like I'm still here and she still remembers that um she you know that was probably when she was two and she'll name now like remember when you would used to just sleep by my door all night (laughs) And I was like, yeah, totally. I slept right by the door. But she she had that perception. And I think that's really what I'm doing for myself. And, you know, also teaching my clients to do is staying by the door mm-hmm. as long as it takes and doing it as many times as it takes. And I think that's what my daughter was feeling was I'm going to be here. And that stability that so many of us did not have, right? That secure trust that this person's going to be there whenever I need them. And I really do see it as such a beautiful opportunity that we get to be there for ourselves. As painful as it is, we're really the only medicine that we need. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And You know, I think that touches on one of the biggest pieces of this work is that it's never too late to heal those early wounds, those early parts of us. I feel like for me, I really made the biggest shift. I was about 29, right? And that happened in my first few months of my life, right? And it's never, Mm. it's never too late and that's available. And, you know, I love that you mentioned time and space because yes, it's giving ourselves time. It's crafting the space finding the right support, right? Yeah. And also giving ourselves permission, giving ourselves Mm -hmm. permission to heal, permission to do things differently, to move differently through the world. Sometimes that means slowing down. Sometimes that means showing up in a new way. And that's vulnerable in any relationship, right? But giving ourselves that permission to, you know, be free from the heaviness that might be there or that anxiety that might be there that might have been there. You know, for me, when I was looking back, I was like, I don't know. I kind of been anxious like forever, (laughs) you know, because it was true. Same. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think I'm just circling back. I want to clarify where I said we get to be our own medicine. I think part of being your own medicine is knowing the support that could be helpful. Right. So not necessarily doing this alone because so much of my healing has been having the support from Sam, Mm -hmm. um, having the support of my coaches, my therapist, and really creating um, the village that maybe we didn't have Mm -hmm. growing up. Yeah. And you know what I love the most about this for those of us who work with people, which I know you both do, um, this shows up in our own embodiment, right? I'm supported. I have my team of support. And so when I show up to support a client, I see this as a web that we're creating. Like it's not this sort of Mm. pyramid and power dynamic. It's like we're a web of support, supporting each other. And, And that's, you know, so many of us struggle with receiving, with being seen in our experience with giving ourselves permission to be supported, I think it can be so powerful to show up with that sense of embodiment and energy when we support clients and others. So true. Yeah. Beautiful. That's the truth. That's the truth. (laughs) That's the truth. I feel it. (laughs) Yes. Well, we're going to ask you our final question, um, which we did ask you in the previous episode. And we were actually all laughing before we hit record because none of us remember what your answer was. (laughs) But let's see if it's the same. Um, But we always want to know just for normalizing it for other people and on this healing journey that these themes that we go through and these core wounds that we um, keep on facing um, that it is 
um, not because there's something wrong with you that it keeps coming up, you know? And so we love to ask people, what are some themes that you've been, yeah, constantly kind of cycling back to and spiraling through um, that continue to show up in your life? Um, yeah, we would love to hear what your answer is this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll have to look back and see if I'm consistent or not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> totally. Um, you know, what comes up for me when it comes to the the theme or what I'm spiraling back to, um, kindness and compassion, just two mm. big values for me. And it's always been really easy for me to offer it to others. And the more I get older, the more I recognize the importance of not forgetting myself in that process. And, and how do I hold compassion for others and compassion for myself and kindness for others, kindness for myself in the work that I do in all my relationships? Um, I think it can be for, for those of us who have this, the, who have this history of her early trauma, I think it can be so easy to be so oriented towards what are they thinking? What do they need? What do they want from me? Right. As a way to keep ourselves safe. And that was definitely part of my history, right? That people pleasing, that fawning and, and, Part of doing my own healing and coming back to myself more and more has been I get to say no and I can be compassionate in my no and I can remember myself and what I need in this process and still extend a bunch of love and compassion for others, right? It's mm. not one or the other. And um, yeah, that's that's what I keep coming back to. Wow. That's so beautiful and so resonant, I think, with all of us mm. and um Thank you just so much for your voice, your wisdom, your perspective, um, honestly, your energy. I think Sam and I can both agree that we feel so grounded um, just through this conversation and so ultimately safe. really safe. Yes, I was just going to say safe. And so just thank you for bringing um, your energy to this space so that all of our listeners can also have a template of what that safety and stability can mm -hmm. feel like um, through through your words and your voice. Mm -hmm. And yes, thank you for coming back a second time because if you haven't heard heard Laurie Ann on episode 28, was it? Yes. You dropped so much wisdom and woke me up to so many things that I was not aware of. And it was just, it was definitely the part one to this incredible part two episode. So we're so grateful for everything you've brought to us and our audience and um, can't wait to co-collaborate with you in the future. Thank mm -hmm. you for being here. Thank you so much. And just uh, before we sign off, um, let us know where we can find you, Laurieann. Maybe it's the same links, but in case you have anything new to share with us, we'll make sure we get that in the show notes. Yeah. So on my website, lauriannebriere.com, it's going to be in the show notes for sure. Instagram, Laurie Briere. Um, that's where I'm most active on social media. I'm, I'm not the most, <laughs> most techie person, but that's where you can find me. Beautiful. Beautiful. We can't wait to send people your way so they can learn more about mm -hmm. how to heal some of these complex patterns um, through tools like somatics and breath work, which are beautiful tools that Gina and I use with ourselves and our containers. Um, we're so grateful to be in good company with you, Laurieann. Mm, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.